And now uh, it's our pleasure to hear from Rabbi Daniel Fox, our next speaker. Thank you very much, Rabbi Mastowski, and uh, everyone at the CRC for arranging this uh, great pro program and uh, ensuring it runs as smoothly as possible. Thank you everyone for coming. I see a bunch of uh, familiar names and some faces and some new ones as well. And I certainly, uh, like you, I'm sure, hope and pray that soon we'll be able to do this in person. We can learn together when it's uh, safe and healthy for everyone to do so. I'm sure that you probably all heard the, uh, the quote that Golda Meir quipped to uh, then President Richard Nixon, explaining why her job was harder than his. He said, uh, quote, you are the president of 150 million Americans. I am the prime minister of six million prime ministers. And uh, she was, of course, referring to the citizens of the state of Israel. But I think there's some truth to uh, Jews around the world that many of us have very strong opinions. We're not afraid or shy to share them. And uh, for better or for worse, the idea of debate or disagreement among our own, machlokas even, has really always been a part of who we are. And it's not just politics, although that might be what we think of first, but Lahavdil to distinguish between the mundane and the sacred. I mean, think about the Torah, open up any book, really any book, any Sefer Kodesh, and the one guarantee is that you will find in that book many, probably on every page, machloksim, disputes, arguments all over the place, from Bracious to uh, Uktsin, and everything in between. If you open up Chumash, you'll find a machlokas between Rashi and Sforno, or Ramban and Ibn Ezra. If you're learning the Mishnah, you'll find Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, and open the Gemara, Abaye and Rava, Yochan Aruch and Rama. Mishnah Baruch Adam, all the way down to modern day poskim, there is no issue, pretty much no issue in the entire Torah that we all agree upon. And we're used to it because every time we learn and every time we come to a shir, we're used to hearing, well, it's a machlokas, that's always the answer. But it's worthwhile to take a moment to think about why this is so and how it could be. I mean, we believe that the Torah is a book full of truth. It's the divine teaching. It's the word of God. It's our guide for life. And incredibly enough, there's basically nothing in it that we all agree about. And we all agree on anything. Uh, parenthetically, now, of course, we have a system in place to decide who we follow and what we do. So if there's a machlokas between Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, of course, we generally follow Beis Hillel. We follow Rava in most cases when he debates Abaye. And the Ashkenazim follow the Ramah, and the Sephardim follow the Shulchan Aruch. We have a system in place to decide, well, practically, what do we do when it's a machlokas? But it doesn't take away from the fact that the Torah is full of arguments and the machloksim still exist. And I want to spend a few minutes tonight discussing why this is so. Now, there's one school of thought. One could suggest that this is merely the reality of transmitting a 3,000 year old tradition. And of course, we have a concept that we are all at Harsinai and that our souls were there, and there's truth to that. But Moshe Rabbeinu was the one who learned the Torah from Hashem. And he, it's the first mission in Pirkei Avos. He passed it on to Yoshua, and Yoshua passed it on to the next generation. We've been passing this along generation to generation over the course of centuries, really millennia. And maybe that's just the way it goes that the messages become slightly blurred. And we're not sure exactly what our Rebbe, our parents, the previous generation said. So, you know, it's kind of like that game of telephone where you whisper a word into the person's ear next to you and he passes it on to the next person. By the time you get to the end, it's not exactly what it was at the beginning because when you pass something along, especially orally, the way that much of the Torah was transmitted for so many years, maybe something got confused. But Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda might disagree on how to interpret a Pasuk. But then in a couple generations later, Abaye and Rav are going to argue about what Rabbi Shimon really said. And then Rashi and Tosfos argue about what Abaye really meant, and so on and so forth. It's just the reality of the way it is. That's it is what it is. That's what happens when you pass something from generation to generation over the course of a few thousand years. And there may be some truth to this idea, but I think it's much deeper than that. I find that very unsatisfying that every time I open any book of Torah, it's full of machloksim just because it is what it is. We don't know when we got the Torah a long time ago. 
I believe, and I'd like to explain over the course of the next few minutes, that machlokas, the existence of debate and dispute in our Torah, is not something that we settle for. It's not bidiyevet, it's not a sad reality, it's not just what can you do, it is what it is, but it actually represents the ideal of what Torah is and what it's supposed to be. It's foundational to the very existence of Torah, and without machlokas, Torah wouldn't be. Certainly Torah wouldn't be what it is. The truth is, I'd go further and I'd posit that machlokas is not just essential to Torah, but it's something absolutely integral and foundational to the world, to humanity, to our relationships, to our lives. That the idea and the existence of debates and disputes sorry, are something that uh, are something that are absolutely crucial to everything that exists in this world. And in fact, I'll tell you that the idea of Machlokas, the existence of a debate, is something that was imbued by Hashem into the world long before human beings ever even existed. What do I mean by that? Whenever we want to try to understand something, we have a principle that some of the philosophers have passed to us, which is that we always go back to the beginning. If we want to understand a certain concept, we have to go back to where this idea was born and where it started. When was the first machlokas, or maybe I should say more precisely, when was the idea of a machlokas created? There's a Medrash Rabbah, Ishis Rabbah, where Rabbi Hanina, one of the Tanaim, says that machlokas was created on the second day of creation. We're going to have to unpack exactly what that means. I mean, at face value, it makes some sense because day two, if you think about what was created on day two, it was a day of division. That's basically all that was created, a, di a, a, a distinction between the lower waters and the upper waters. There was nothing new. It was just a day of splitting. And therefore, on some level, it makes sense if you had to pick a day that Machlokas was created on day two. Of course, by the way, there are other opinions in the Medrash. Not everybody agrees to that. I like to kind of imagine that the Tanaim had a, had a sense of humor and that when Rabbi Hanina said, I think that Machlokas was created on day two, that one of the other Tanaim said, well, I disagree. And, uh, and then they all kind of laughed together and then refocused and continued writing the Midrash. But we can't even agree, of course, on when Machlokas was created. But Rabbi Hanina at least suggests that Machlokas was created on day two. What does that mean that Machlokas was created on day two? How could it be that the concept of disagreement or debate was created before human beings existed? Before even animals, before anything existed, there was a light darkness and a division between the waters. And on that day, Machlokas was created? What does that even mean? Let's take one step back. Almost every single day of creation includes the words that Hashem looked at what he created and saw, Vayar Elohim Kitov, that God saw that it was good. There's only one day about which the Torah does not mention that God saw that it was good. And that was, of course, the second day of creation. But what does it even mean that there was a day that Hashem didn't think was good? Then why did he create that day? Everything Hashem does is good. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't leave something out. How could it be that there was a day of creation about which Hashem didn't say it was good? What does that even mean? We look to Rashi, and Rashi gives, at first glance, somewhat of a strange answer that only confuses us more. Here's what Rashi says. Anyone remember from the beginning of the Torah? Rashi says that the reason that the second day of creation doesn't say, Vayar Lokim Kitov, it doesn't say that Hashem saw that it was good, is because Hashem didn't finish what he started creating on the second day. In fact, he didn't finish what he created on the second day until the third day, which is why if you look closely on the third day, it says Kitov twice. Once for that which he finished that he began on the second day, a makeup Kitov of sorts, and once for what he began and finished creating on day three. So Kitov is omitted on day two because Hashem didn't finish, so to speak, 
And on day three, we have a double kitov. What does that mean? Did Hashem run out of time? I mean, I would understand if, 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 if I was the one who created the world, there would probably be lots of Rashis like this. I didn't finish on day two, so I finished on day three, and I got distracted by an important phone call on day four. There might even be like five Kitovs on day five or six. Who knows? But this is Hashem creating the world. He didn't mismanage his time. He didn't forget. He didn't make a mistake. But what does it mean that the Kitov of day two is on day three? Because on day two, he didn't finish what he started. Obviously, Hashem didn't run out of time. So what is he teaching us? Here's what I think it means. As long as there is one of something, as long as there is a chad, then there can't be a machlokas. You know, think about it. If you are the uh, all-powerful CEO of your own company, you answer to no one and you make every decision on your own, then there can be no such thing as an argument or a machlokas. I mean, someone can try arguing with you. They can send you lots of emails or call you, but if in your eyes, their opinion is worthless, and if you're the one ultimately who makes the decisions and you're in charge, so then there is no such thing as a machlokas. There's only one, and that's it. Might not always make the best decision. Maybe sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But machlokas isn't even possible. It's only when a second thing, a second being, or a second person exists in machlokas that the idea of disagreement or dispute even becomes a possibility. I'll give you another example. You know, think back. Maybe for some of you, it's just a couple of years ago, some, some a bit longer. Maybe some it's even in your future. But to when you were in college or seminary or yeshiva, and you were basically on your own, maybe you needed, uh, you know, your parents had to give you some money, but let's assume that you were pretty much, uh, pretty much making your own decisions. You have a roommate, but you can kind of each do whatever, you, whatever you'd like. So there's very little machlokas. There's not that much to argue about. I spend my money the way I want. I go to sleep when I want. I do my work when I want. Probably end up making some really poor decisions and going to sleep way too late and wasting money and wasting time. There is no machlokas. I only answer to myself. And then all of a sudden you get married. And even though, you know, when you were dating, could never imagined that it would even ever happen. But suddenly there's a real possibility of machlokas. Now that there's two of you living together and sharing your stuff and your time and responsibilities, so the possibility of a machlokas emerges. And symbolically, that's what's happening in the days of creation. Day one of creation is one. There is no second thing yet in existence. There is no such thing as machlokas because there's only one day. But once there is a day two, now all of a sudden, and this is what Rabbi Hanina is teaching us, the potential and the possibility of a machlokas is born. In fact, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that the word sheni, which means second, comes from the word shone, which means different. Once there's a second something, whatever it is, by definition, there's something different. That's gonna be different and that's gonna see something different and that's going differently and that's gonna have different opinions. Now, of course, the days aren't arguing with each other. The days don't argue. They don't have opinions. Symbolically, that's what Rabbi Hanina means when he says that on the second day of creation, Machlokas was created because when there's that Shani, when there's that second thing, the second being in existence, now the possibility of debate emerges. Now, here's the question of the day. Is Machlokas a good thing or a bad thing? We understand that it exists. We know when it was created. Is it good or is it bad? Because that should tell us our answer. Should it say Kitov or should it not? On the day that Machlokas was created, was this a good day or was it a bad day? So the answer is that it is neither good nor bad, but it depends what happens next. I'll give you another example. A lot of stories, but hopefully this will clarify uh, what I'm about to explain. Let's take a married couple, just for the sake of example. It could be friends, it could be uh, siblings, parents and children, whoever you want. Think of your own, your own examples in your own mind. But let's take for now a, uh, a married couple. And one of the spouses says, just for argument's sake, for an example, 
let's go to, let's take a vacation to Israel this summer. We haven't, we haven't taken the kids to Israel. We haven't been there in a long time. Let's go to Israel this summer. He's got this great idea. So by the way, if he, if he didn't have a family and he was in, uh, he was on his own, so he had enough money and whatever he could, that's it. <laughs> there would be no discussion. There would be no machlokas. There would be no questions. There would be no contrary opinions. And he would book his flight to Israel and he would go. But he mentions it, or he, I didn't mean to say he, I was trying to leave it, you know, you can uh, fill in the details on your own, but this spouse <laughs> mentions his or her spouse, let's go to Israel this summer. And the other spouse says, hold on a second. I mean, I'd love to go to Israel. I know we haven't been there in a while, but do I have enough vacation days and uh, tickets are very expensive over the summer. And uh, I don't know, we have my nephew's wedding. We can't miss that. And all of a sudden, your great idea that for a moment there was, was just one with nothing against it is now being questioned and attacked from all different angles. And there are four or five good questions that have challenged my one idea. What happens next? Is that good or is that bad? Well, there are two options. If I respond to those questions by saying, What's wrong with you? Why do you always knock down my ideas? You're ruining the fun. Why can't you just go along with it? Who cares about your nephew's wedding? Obviously, that is bad. I'm not going to end up going to Israel and probably have a pretty miserable summer at best. But if you can react to those questions and say, those are great questions, and let's think about it. You know, maybe uh, we can leave a little earlier than I had suggested because so we can be back for the wedding and maybe I have some miles that I saved up so it's not so expensive, whatever the details are. When I answer those questions, I've now taken an idea that was just, let's go to Israel, a nice idea, but that had really nothing to it. And now I've sharpened the idea. I've come up with when it mo makes most sense to go, how it makes most sense to book, all of the details become clarified and sharpened. By the way, there's another possibility. It could be that when these questions are thrown at me, I say, these are great questions and I don't know. I guess we can't go to Israel this summer. Sometimes when you're attacked in a machlokas or when you're questioned in a machlokas, you say, you're right. I guess we don't paskin like me this time. And that's good too, because that means that there is a, an idea that you thought for a moment was good, but you discovered that it probably wasn't so good. And thankfully to the machlokas, you now push it aside. Even better is when you can preserve your original idea and sharpen it. Because through answering these questions that are thrown at you, you've taken what was an idea, what was just sort of an idea in the air, you've taken what maybe was a good idea, and through answering these questions, you've sharpened it into something that's real, something that's true, something that can truly exist and be lasting. And that is what a machlokas is in the Torah. That's what's happening when Rashi argues with Ramban and when Abayi argues with Rava and when Rav Moshe Feinstein argues with Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach and every other example you can think of. What happens is that one rabbi or one mefarish shares his interpretation of a pasuk, a halacha, a mishnah, whatever it might be. And somebody else then share, comes and shares a contrary opinion asks questions or brings proofs against, sometimes even strongly. And sometimes it becomes a real battle, a milcham shel Torah, a war over the truth of Torah. But a proper Talmud Chacham doesn't, or proper any person, couldn't answer by being angry and saying, stop attacking me, go away, just let my halacha be, don't ask questions. But they now have to contemplate. And sometimes they might say, oh, you're right, great proof. I'm wrong. That happens in the Gemara sometimes. And the, uh, the Tanaim or the Amarim will say, you're right, wrong, Kasha. I don't have an answer. Choserbi, I'm, I'm, I'm retracting what I suggested. More often what happens is if you bring a Brisa to challenge me, I'll explain the Brisa differently. I'll bring a brisa, different Brisa to defend myself. Or you bring one Pusik and I'll bring another Pusik. And all of a sudden we're taking what was just opinions, something that started off as mutter and usser, kosher and not kosher, and we're sharpening it through the prism of machlokas and through the development and the discussion and the questions and the answers and the proofs and the disproofs and the sources and the reasons. All of a sudden, we take an opinion or an idea that 
might have been good at the beginning and it's now been sharpened and clarified, now it's become something that we can say, Kitov, that it's actually good. If you can withstand the attacks of a machlokes, if you can sharpen your opinion by responding to the questions that are asked on you, now, now your opinion, now the machlokes has fulfilled its purpose, now your opinion becomes doubly good, very good. Because now you've shown it's not just an idea, but it's something that I can defend and something with strength. That's why Torah is a book full of machlokas, because that's what the rabbis are constantly doing with each other, arguing, sharpening, digging to the truth by examining every pasuk and every opinion from every angle and every perspective. That by the time we get down to their bottom line opinions, by the time we put it into our lives, by the time it becomes the halacha, we, we can be confident and comfortable that it's been tested, it's been examined, and now really it's ketov. Now it's really very, very good. We talked about ketov, what is good? What is the first time that the Torah says something is not good? Well, it actually fits perfectly into this idea. Because Hashem says, Lo tov adam levado. It is not good for a person to be alone. It's not good just to be stuck at that one without a machlokas, without anybody to challenge you or to ask questions. Because then you'll have all these crazy ideas and you'll just do them. Because there's no one to say, hold on a second, what are you doing? And not everything will be good. Because you're missing that second, that sheni, you're missing the machlokas. Therefore, Hashem says, lo ezer I'm going to make for Adam. And it's a strange phrasing, ezer kinegdo. Ezer means help, and kinegdo, kineged, means against. Which one is it? Is your spouse helping you, or is they, or are they against you? So Rashi says, it depends. If you're lucky, if you're Zoha, if you merit a, uh, a good match and a good marriage, so then ezer. Then you'll help each other. And unfortunately, sadly, if it doesn't work out and you're not Zoha, then connect though. Then you'll constantly be butting heads and you'll be against each other. Two possibilities. Hopefully you get Azer. Some people unfortunately get connect though. But I think there might be another way of reading this Pasuk. Maybe it's both. Maybe the purpose, the mission of a marriage, of a partnership, of having two people together is that they are azer kinegdo, that they help you by being against you. They're that second opinion that sees things differently, sheni from shoneh. They have that different perspective, different background, different life experience. They create the machlokas, the good kind of machlokas, the machlokas that challenges you to make better decisions and to defend your opinions. Azer kinegdo, and by being connected you, by sometimes opposing you, and by sometimes raising contrary perspectives, that in itself is the help. A good marriage is both. Is there a I'll give one more example. Maybe you've heard this story before. Gemara and Bava Mitzia. Of Pei Dalid Amud Aleph. If I were with you in person, I would uh, pass out the Gemara, but Screen sharing sometimes gets complicated, so take my word for it, but look it up after if you'd like. It talks about Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan, who apparently were Chavrusas for many years. They were actually brothers-in-law also. Fascinating background to Reish Lakish and how he became a Baal Tshuva, started his life as a bandit, ultimately saw the light, started studying Torah, married into Rabbi Yochanan's family, became the great Reish Lakish, and was Chavrusas with Rabbi Yochanan for many years. And Reish Lakish got very sick, and Rabbi Yochanan, they were davening for him, and sadly, tragically, Rabbi Reish Lakish passed away. So this is a big uh, big problem, because this is, uh, I mean, these were the Gedolei Ador, the greats of the generation. They were the ones who were, you know, creating and developing the Torah that we continue to study today. So the other Rabbanim gathered together and were discussing who can we 
substitute as a new Chavrusa for Rabbi Yochanan. Can't learn with Reish Lakish anymore. Reish Lakish has died. Who can be Rabbi Yochanan's new Chavrusa? So they selected Rabbi Elazar ben Pedas. The Gemara says, Mechaded in Shmaitzei. He saw the Torah, the, the topics very sharply. Brilliant guy. Very wise. Huge Talmud Chacham. They figured he's the perfect guy. He'll substitute, he'll, he'll you know, slide in, take Reish Lakish's place. It'll be a seamless transition, and Rabbi Yochanan will have a new wonderful Chavrusa. The Gemara says that they were learning together, and everything Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Lazar Pedas would bring him proofs, and he would say, oh, there's a brisa that supports your opinion, there's this Pasuk that supports your opinion, and he would constantly be giving, lending support to every opinion stated by Rabbi Yochanan. And Rabbi Yochanan got very, very frustrated, and Rabbi Yochanan said to him, listen, when I used to learn with Reish Lakish, everything I said, he would bring 24 questions on me. And through answering those 24 questions one by one with careful analysis, I would sharpen my opinions. That when I was done answering his 24 challenges, I knew what I said was right and was strong and was true. Everything I say to you, you bring me 24 proofs. He doesn't say these words, but I can imagine him saying, I don't need your proofs. I know I'm right. I think I'm right. That's why I said it. Your proofs don't help me. I want you to challenge me. Be connected me. Attack me. Question me. And then when I can defend myself, if I can defend myself, then it will sharpen what I've said. And Rabbi Yochanan began crying and walking around and he was yelling, Hey Cha'at Bar Lakisha, Hey Cha'at Bar Lakisha, where are you, Reish Lakish? Where are you, Reish Lakish? I can't learn Torah anymore without, without machlokas, without somebody challenging me. I can't my Torah is not Torah. I have the Gadol Ador sitting next to me bringing a proof for everything I say, and it's nothing. I need a machlokas. Sadly, the Gemara ends, it's confusing and tragic. Rabbi Yochanan ends up getting sick or kind of going crazy, and he ends up dying as well. Rabbi Yochanan understood that the best of Rusa, the best way to learn, the best way to live, is with somebody who can challenge you, who can be an Azer Kinegdo, who everything you say will ask, you know, my example I gave earlier, I said three or four questions. Rabbi Yochanan says everything I said to Rish Lakish, he asked 24 questions. Must have taken him days to respond to Rish Lakish's challenges. But he was able to think about it, analyze, examine, respond, and that's what made him Rabbi Yochanan. And that's why we learn the opinions of Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish and all their machloksim and all their debates until today. Because we understand that it's through the power of this debate, through these questions and answers and the back and forth, that makes the Torah, and makes a relationship something strong and something true. And that, I think, is what Rashi means when he says that on the second day of creation, Hashem doesn't say kitov. Obviously, not because Hashem ran out of time. He didn't forget what he started or he didn't, uh, wasn't getting dark. Darkness had just been created the day before. It wasn't, wasn't getting dark and he, uh, he had to put it aside till the next day. But the second day of creation was the day of the creation of division. As I mentioned before, it was the day of Yehi Rakia, a division between the upper waters and the lower waters. And as Rabbi Hanina taught us in the Medrash, it was the day of the creation of the birth of Machlokas. And as we asked before, is Machlokas split? Is division good or bad? Well, the answer is, it depends where it leads. Only time will tell. You know, it never says that the second day was bad. If Machlokas was by definition bad, then it would say, Vayar Lokim Eskol Asher Vinei Lotov. It would never say that, but then it would say Hashem saw that it wasn't good. It's not bad, but we also can't say it's good yet. We have to see what happens on day three. It's like when one spouse challenges the other spouse and asks them all these questions, is it good or bad? If we could freeze frame at that moment, it's not yet good or bad. It depends where the conversation leads, how the first spouse responds. Is this going to lead to anger and just further division? Or is this going to lead to a sharpening of ideas and a clarification? Let's see what happens on day three. If on day three, there's just more and more division. Split this, split that, division here, division that. 
then we'd never see another low tov, another key tov. Then we would get to low tov. This isn't working out. But obviously, that's not what Hashem had in mind. That's not what he's teaching us. What happens on day three? The division of the upper waters and the lower waters leads to dry land, grass, plants, flowers, trees. It's the very water in the sky and the water down below. It's that splitting that provides the nourishment and the ability for the growth and the continuation of the world. And that's why Hashem says, ah, now I can say, firstly, about the two, Kitov. That machlokas was good because that machlokas nourished growth. It didn't lead to further division. It led to the purpose of machlokas, which is further development and growth. Machlokas has the ability to divide and destroy, God forbid. And sadly, often when we hear the term machlokas, especially if it, it's said about, uh, God forbid, a family, a community, a shul, the Jewish people, we usually think of it in ways of being destructive because we're not listening to each other and responding to challenges and sharpening ideas, but we're usually attacking back or engendering, uh, God forbid, anger or further discord or distance. What the Torah is teaching us, what Hashem is teaching us through the days of creation is that if you can use machlokas for growth and for development, then that can be doubly tov. On day three, it says kitov and it says kitov because it's double good. The machlokas itself has exponentially lended itself to the continued growth of the world. So in a way, we are, in my opinion, very lucky to learn a Torah and to be part of a people that is full of machlokas. That's what keeps us honest, it keeps us sharp, and that's what keeps it true. That's what keeps the Torah authentic. That's what keeps our relationships real. When we can debate and discuss and challenge and sharpen, sharpen our ideas and our understandings. And anytime you get into an argument, whether it be about Torah, whether you're involved in the Mecham Teshel Torah and the battle of Torah, or it could be about anything else in life, and we know it happens all the time. So, and uh, I'm saying this to myself as much as anybody else. When you are challenged, when those 24 questions are, are asked of you, take a moment to pause and say, this is that moment. This is the space between day two and day three. This is that freeze frame where now I'm going to decide and my reaction is going to determine is this Kitov? Is it doubly Kitov? Or is this just going to lead to further division? We can't answer that yet until we see what continues. Every time we have an argument, every time we get into discussion, when we're learning Torah, when we're speaking to family, our friends, those around us, even the world at large, we have the opportunity to use that machlokas to make things kitov kitov. And I hope and I bless us that we should all be zoche to only engage in machlokas l'shem shamayim, that all of our debates and our disputes, all of our arguments, our disagreements should always be for the sake of Hashem. Ultimately, those machlokas, and when done in the right way, bring us closer to Hashem, and believe it or not, I think they can even bring us closer to each other. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Fox. We appreciate the um, the Torah and the Shir.